as you find your way to Galatians chapter 4. I wanted to let those of you know who are a little clock conscious that uh, service is going to go a little longer today. We're, we've sensed the presence of the Lord with us and uh, singing has gone and uh, the Lord's Supper and all that uh, has gone a little longer and so I'm not going to modify the message. Is that okay? Um, we're going to speak the word if that's all right. If it's not, well, go to sleep, take a nap, and uh, you'll, you'll be okay. Uh, it won't, it won't uh, I'm pretty sure it won't kill anybody today. Well, I wanted to let you know, we delivered those gifts that you delivered. I, I want to thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, the, we delivered, we're thinking somewhere around uh, six to $7,000 worth of gifts to that one family, the Walker family. I'm able to tell you now who it is in part because they put it on Facebook. So it's not a secret anymore, but I let the family be the one to tell who it is uh, so that we don't to risk embarrassing them. And uh, they had an amazing Christmas. If you could have heard the children as we were pulling presents out of the, the inside of the truck, and then we uncovered the truck, and it was this, just one of the kids like, holy cow, it's a wall of gifts. And uh, we go inside, and one of the most uh, precious moments that, that I have in, in doing this is to gather in their living room and pray for them, and the tears flowed as they received your gifts of generosity to them. So thank you so much for participating in that and appreciate it more than, than you could ever know. We have spent the last three months looking at the mission of the church. We are GFN Church, obviously that stands for Greenville First Nazarene, but it also stands for what we do. So GFN is who we are and GFN is what we do. Uh, we are a people who, is committed to, who are committed to God. We are a people who are committed to family. We are a people who are committed to our neighbor. And, and so all of the sermon series from here on out will probably be couched within the framework of God, family, or neighbor. Now the reason we keep talking about it is because the enemy has a way of distracting God's people from God's mission. It does not take very long for the enemy to succeed in doing that. And so we will keep the mission in front of us. We will keep talking about the mission. We will, we will consider the scriptures in light of the mission because this is God's mission. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. The world will know you're my disciples by how you love each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are core to what it means to be a Christian. And uh, so I would encourage you to remember that. And then if you could do me a favor, some of you like to gather on New Year's Eve with friends and family. If there is someone in the church that, uh, that um, God directs you to, will you make sure you invite them as well? Don't just target the folks you might normally target, but ask the Lord this New Year's Eve. Father, is there anyone that, uh, is not, that might not be gathering in other settings that you would like me to invite to my home? So if you're having a gathering, pray that prayer and uh, see what God might do to answer that prayer. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Very brief passage this morning. Galatians chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son then an heir through God. When the fullness of time had come. If you are like me, you typically live with the hope that the fullness of God's time is synonymous with it's about time. We, we want God's timing to be our timing. We want God's plan to be in our plan. We want... We want them to be married to each other. We, we sometimes can struggle with how it is that God works, and more specifically, when it is that God's, God works. The last year has been a year of upheaval in my life. I told the church board when they gathered at my house at the first week of December, I said, do you all realize that... Uh, see, you guys are influencing me. Do you all realize that... Uh, <laughs> One year ago that night, uh, the district superintendent called to say, hey, uh, would you be interested in considering this church in South Carolina? 
Well, you know how that turned out. What, what you might not know is, is how God, the fullness of time, worked in that. When your pastor resigned, the church board, as every church board does, enters into conversation with the district superintendent, and you begin to try to figure out who's our next pastor going to be. The first pastor you interviewed, um, at least I believe he was the first pastor, had a choice between saying yes to the church board or saying yes to the mission field. I believe that was the first one. He picked the mission field. Um, And so the church board had to wrestle with, what do we do? So they called somebody else. And he had to wrestle with between Greenville and a district superintendency. He picked the district superintendency. And uh, so one of the questions they asked me is, do you plan on going to the mission field or is anyone asking you to be a district superintendent? And I said, I pray not. <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, we laughed about that. So the interesting thing is, if you would have called me first, I probably would have said no. I won't even consider it. Interestingly enough, um, several months later, you called, and God was very clear saying, don't say no. And that was all he was saying for a decent amount of time, December, don't say no. January, when we had the board Skype thing, don't say no. I did my best to fly under your radar. I I gave a pathetic resume to the church board. I told the DS that I sent him the most pathetic resume that I could. And uh, because Jesus came in last place, if they said, oh, this guy is a loser, we don't want to talk to him, I'm okay with that. I didn't want to promote myself to the board. And if God was going to be in it, it needed to be God was the one that needed to be doing this. And there was one question when I came to interview with the church board that uh, was the turning point for me. I don't remember, even remember who asked it. I think I know, but I'm not certain. Somebody said, why in the world, when things are going so good at Painesville, would you even consider moving to Greenville? And I paused before I answered that question. And, And in that moment, God very clearly pressed on my heart that if they offered you this position, you'd better say yes. Interestingly enough, would you believe that the first person you interviewed was installed at Painesville last week? Yeah, I had that reaction too. I was like, are you serious? The person that said no to you, who was ushered off into one of our creative mission areas, um, things got shut down there pretty quick, was brought back to the United States and heard about a church in Painesville, Ohio that needed a pastor. So the first person you interviewed went to where I was while I came here while God worked out the fullness of time. I didn't find that out until this week. That's usually how God works. We don't find out how it is that God is working. I'm, ask my wife, I am a ducks in a row kind of man. She, if she could jump and wave a hanky like the old timers did and said, hallelujah, that is the truth, she would. I am a ducks in a row kind of guy. I like to know where it is that God is leading. I like to know how it is that God is leading. And one thing is very huge when you're a pastor. It's one thing to know where God is leading. You have to know the right way to get there because if you don't do it the right way, people will interpret the right way as the wrong way because you're doing it the wrong way. And so you've got to not only get to the right place, you've got to get to the right place in the right way, otherwise it throws into question the right way itself. And so all through life I'm trying to strategize, how is it that God wants to work in this area? How is it that God might be working in this other area? What are the potential obstacles? How is it that I can communicate and strategize in such a way to overcome the obstacles that might be in the hearts and minds of people so that we can get to God's preferred future? And, and, and then God like messes with my ducks. You sound like you've been there. (laughs) So when I read a passage about the fullness of time, it it, it just, it's, I I read that and and you you do know, I'm sure, if you don't, let me just quickly say that that the, the biblical words for time are very different when we talk about God's time versus normal time. Fullness of time, the word, biblical words for that are very different than normal time or our time. They're very different. It's a, it's a different Greek word. 
I was in the sanctuary praying, and um, God just came to me with his peace, with his fullness of time issue. He says, Terry, I've, I've got your life. Every good thing is from me. I, I have your back. Just, just trust me with the fullness of time. Rest in my presence. I've got this. We face these fullness of time issues in our life. We do, and they come to us in different forms and in different ways all through our life. When we are young, they take one shape. When we're in middle age, they might take a different shape. When we're older, they might take a different shape. The fullness of time comes at us in different ways, and, and, and it always results in new opportunities for us to communicate to God the full extent of our trust in Him. The fullness of time. You can trust the Lord today with however it is He defines the fullness of time in your life this morning. There's an assumption then that uh, Paul moves to when he's speaking to the Galatians that we are sons and daughters of God. Now this morning I'm not going to make that assumption that everyone that is in our sanctuary today is a son or daughter of God. The last Sunday of 2015 could be a great Sunday for someone to be adopted into God's family. And I want to take a moment to, to consider that this morning. Does God's spirit, in the core of your spirit, in here where it matters, with, without the games, without trying to convince people of what is or is not true, in your spirit, does God's spirit testify with your spirit that you have been adopted into his family? I'm not asking you, are you a Christian? I'm not asking you, have you prayed the sinner's prayer? We need to come to terms with the fact, and I've said it before, other pastors are saying it as well, it seems that there is a rediscovery of these biblical terms like repentance, justification, regeneration, adoption. There is a rediscovery of these terms in the church in America today. So the way to, to understand as to whether or not I am or I'm not a son or daughter of God, it's very... It's, it's a decision, it's a question that only you can answer. Does God's spirit testify to your spirit that you are his son, that you are his daughter, that you can call him father? Jesus Christ came so that, so that our, our sins could be atoned for. We call that atonement that in the death and resurrection of Jesus, every sin that has been committed, every sin that would ever be committed has all been provided for, all forgiveness has been provided for through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus has done everything that is needed to be done for you to enter into relationship with him. You don't have to fix yourself this morning. Jesus has done the work. So he did the work, now he comes to us. We call it provenient grace, where the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of the very things that we have done that separate us from God. We call this provenient grace, the grace that goes before salvation. And the Holy Spirit comes and pricks our conscience. You see, the problem with praying the sinner's prayer is the assumption that there is, that there is guilt over personal sin that would cause us to move to a place of repentance. Because without repentance, the impact of the atonement cannot be applied in our life. Jesus has done everything except repent for us. We have to be the ones to repent. We have to be the ones to come to an Isaiah moment where we say, woe is me, I'm a person with unclean lips living in a land of unclean lips. And if something doesn't change in my life and in my relationship with God, I am a dead man, a dead woman walking this planet. We need 
to repent of sin, a thorough change of mind about sin, not a regret over getting caught, a regret about the behaviors themselves, whereby we once were going one direction, now we go another direction. We once thought that sin was attractive, now we say no more. Once we were engaged in a lifestyle of rebellion against the known law of God, now we are walking in the revelation that God has given to us. We must come to a place of repentance, and without repentance, I don't care how many tracts you have read, there is not a relationship to be found with Jesus Christ. We have to recapture this in the church in America today. And if we repent, the Bible's filled with promises. He will adopt us as a son and a daughter. He will regenerate our spiritual nature. Just like a wound that you get on your arm heals, the Holy Spirit comes in and he restores that which is broken spiritually inside of us. And he justifies us. He looks at us as though we have never sinned before. I tell people in membership class at this point, did you guys hear about the accident that I was in last week that nearly cost me my life? They're like, no, I didn't. They freak out. I said, it's because it never happened. That wasn't very nice, Pastor. Well, see, the same feeling that you had over something that didn't exist, this is what justification is. God doesn't just forgive you of your sins. He looks at you as though it never happened. This is whole forgiveness, folks. And these are all functions of the Holy Spirit after we repent of sin. We become sons. We become daughters. 2016 is too important of a year for you to enter it with spiritual doubt in your life. This morning, the Holy Spirit can testify with your spirit that you are a son, you're a daughter of God. Paul goes on to tell the Galatians that because of that, if you're a son, then you are an heir through God. You're an heir through God. If, if you have ever seen the Princess Diaries, you know something of this idea of being an heir. If you've never seen it, there is a princess who doesn't know she's a princess. Her name is Mia Thermopolis. You, I think they could have come up with a better name than that, except it probably sounds Genovian, because that is the country for which she is the potential princess. Her dad was the king, and uh, her mom is living in the United States, and she doesn't know that she's heir to the throne of Genovia until her grandmother shows up when she's about 16 and tells her that she needs to make a choice. She's getting ready to turn 16, and if she would desire to do so, she can become an heir to the throne in Genovia. Princess Diaries 2 tells us that not only does she have to decide that, but if she wants to keep the crown, she has to get married. Unless she changes the rules, but that's the whole point of the second movie. I won't tell you how that ends in case you've not seen it. <laughs> here's, here's the point. In addition to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus with limited vision, we... I think to some degree are shortchanging what it means to be an heir of God. There are real implications to that. And by not communicating those real implications, I think we're robbing people of the fullness of the decision that is at work in repentance. So let me be clear. Jesus is the one that changes our life. He does the work. One of my favorite outdoorsman is for all of his quirks is a man named Phil Robertson he he says I used to be into dope and to women and to booze but when Jesus got a hold of me he dealt with the booze and he dealt with the women and he dealt with the drugs and he set me free he didn't fix those things and then come to Jesus he came to Jesus who fixed those things. That's in part what I'm talking about when it comes to being an heir. Just like Princess Mia had to wrestle with the implications of what it meant to enter into the crown 
of Genovia. So too, we need to wrestle with the implications of what it might mean for us to enter into relationship with Jesus Christ. Folks, Jesus says, if you are in Christ, you are going to be a new creation. The old will be gone, the new will come, and all this is from Christ who is reconciling us to the Father. If we enter into relationship with Jesus, there is transformation. He will make you new. That means some of the things you currently might be engaged in, you're probably not going to do those anymore, not because you're fixing yourself, but because the Holy Spirit transforms you so that you don't want to do those things anymore. But not only is there this negative impact, I don't do these things anymore, God changes our life so that we are positively engaged in activities that we never would have considered before. We want to worship the Lord because he is the one that changed us. We want to love each other because that person that previously drove you nuts, that God has transformed me and I want to love that person in Jesus' name. The neighbor that drives you nuts, whereas before you wanted to drive them nuts, now because Jesus has changed you, you want to love that person in Jesus' name. These are positive things for us. Before we didn't have hope, now we have hope. Before we didn't have peace, now we have peace. Brothers and sisters, God changes our life and this is an incredible thing to be an heir of God. All the power that was available to Jesus, available to us. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives where? In us. We sang it. Do we live like that? You are an heir to the Most High God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to open the altar this morning, this last Sunday of 2015, to give opportunity for anyone that would like to pray. It might be this morning that you're having a fullness of time struggle. A fullness of time struggle. And by coming forward today, you would say to him, Father, I'm tired of wrestling with this fullness of time. This morning, I trust you. Help me to live in that fullness of time trust this morning. Some of you, when I asked, does the Holy Spirit testify to the core of who you are, that you are a child of God, you, you, you would say, no, he doesn't. You don't have to leave this morning with that same doubt. You don't. I invite you, too, to come and pray. (laughs) And do not leave until you know that you know that you know that Jesus has set you free. And maybe some are struggling to live in the... in in this same power that is in Jesus, is in us. You're struggling to live there. And you would come forward to say, Lord, I, I don't want 2015, 2016 to be like 2015. I want the power of Jesus that, that was present when he rose from the grave, that, that power that rose him from the grave. I, I want that power in me, not for my own sake, but for, for my, my family and my children and my grandchildren and my loved ones and my coworkers and my neighbors. Let that power reign in me this year. So this is a morning to to receive from God whatever it is that, that you might need. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, without uh, begging and pleading, these are simple decisions. Will I live in the fullness of time? Will I be a son or daughter? Will I live as an heir? Father, if you are speaking by the power of your spirit to anyone in this sanctuary this morning, may they not care about what other people will conclude. May they not care about people surmising as to the cause of their going forward. 
May they declare with their heart and mind, I'm going to spend this moment with the Almighty and I need him to touch my heart and my life today. Give that man, that woman, the courage to say yes to your spirit's direction this morning. Father, when they respond, do what only you can do in our heart and in our life. Do your work. Do your work. In Jesus' name. Would you raise your hand and we will pray for you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. You, I see your hand. You can put your hands down. I see your hand. We'll pray for you. Somebody say, Pastor, I don't have an assurance of faith. And I want today to receive an assurance of faith that God would bear witness with my spirit that I'm a son, a daughter of the king. Would you raise your hand? This one will take some courage here. I see your hand. Anyone else? We'll pray for you. I see your hand. Anyone else? I see your hand. Yeah, good. Anyone say, Pastor, I want to live as an heir of Jesus in 2016. The power of Jesus would reign in me as at the resurrection. Would you raise your hand? We'll pray for you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see yours. I see yours. You can put your hand down. I see your hand. Anyone else? I see your hand. Will you stand with me? If you have a friend down here you'd like to put your hand on, support and pray with these folks that are here this morning, we'd encourage you to come and pray with them. Father, as we sing this closing song, may the power of your spirit work here at these altars and in our sanctuary that you would work by the power of your spirit in us today, that we would realize the victory this morning. If we're struggling with the fullness of time, that your spirit would give us peace. If we're struggling to know in our heart that we're a child of the Most High, would you give us an assurance of faith by which we can look at you this morning and call you our Father? And if we're struggling to live in the power of the resurrection, May you work in us today, and we will praise your holy name in Jesus' name. Now may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And may the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead be in you and through you and give you the victory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.